The Supreme Court sat on Thursday to hear arguments of the petitioner and the respondents of the 2020 election petition for a review of its ruling on February 11. The court had earlier ruled that the chairperson of the first respondent cannot be compelled to mount the witness box. My colleague Sixtus Don Ulo has details of the proceedings in court. <laughs> Mr. Chachuchi Kata argued his application for review on five grounds, urging the enhanced panel to consider errors of law in the substantive ruling, which he said occasioned a miscarriage of justice. Order 36 4. 36 4 3. They made explicit reference to that, and they also made reference to order 38 rule 3 e 5 those were the two orders the two rules of court that they referred to nothing else my lords nothing else no reference whatsoever was made to order 38 rule 3 e 1 by the respondent, by counsel for the respondent, when they put their positions before you. Your lordship's ruling, which made no reference whatsoever to section 26 of the Evidence Act 1975, that ruling was per incurium, that provision of the law. Your lordships made no reference whatsoever to that. That's clear on the face of the ruling. Mr. Chikata insisted on his argument that EC Chief Jin Mensa gave a conclusive presumption of her availability to testify and be cross-examined and could not, therefore, now abdicate. We cannot just treat lightly the depositions that have been made on oath by the chairperson of the first respondent. We cannot treat them lightly because the Evidence Act is clear about the effect of those depositions in its terms. Except as otherwise provided by law, including a rule of equity, when a party has, by his own statement, act, or omission, intentionally and deliberately caused or permitted another person to believe a thing to be true and to act upon such belief, the truth of that thing shall be conclusively presumed against that party or his successors in interest in any proceeding between that party or his successors in interest and such relying person or his successors in interest. Arguing against the application, Justin Amenuvo, counsel for the Lecture Commission, maintained that the court's earlier ruling occasioned no miscarriage of justice to warrant the instant application. We need to bear sight of the fact that there is a second part of Section 26, assuming that there are even representations made. What reliance did the petitioner Place on those representations. My laws, the petitioner filed, uh, filed this application for interrogatories and argued it fully in spite of those depositions. When the court ruled against the petitioner, he filed a review and argued it fully. The petitioner again filed an application for inspection of documents, pursued it fully. Milos, is it the case that we are saying that the reliance that the petitioner placed on those depositions was that he argued the cases to the end? For Mr. Akuto Ampao, lead counsel for President Akufuado, the court's earlier ruling was fair and just. Now this application 
is a classic case of an aggrieved party who has become emotional by the decision of the court. A major foundation of this application is the interest of justice. My Lord, we all know that when courts rule based on the interest of justice, it's not at, at large. It is in reference to the specific circumstances of each case. So, my Lord, it cannot be that the interest of justice is a ratio. I mean, it cannot be. For Mr. Chikata, a witness must at all times be distinguished from a party for the purposes of testifying in any process. And the review panel, enhanced by Lovelace Johnson JSC and Amadou Tanko JSC, rendered their verdict. In this application, the Counsel Council for the Applicant has taken this through various aspects of the ruling without demonstrating to the court areas in which this ruling has occasioned discourage of justice. To succeed on the first leg under this rule, the alleged error must not only be established by the applicant, must also, but must also demonstrate that a miscarriage of justice has been occasioned by the ruling. In its further submissions, counsel for the applicant referred to section 26 of the Evidence Act NRCD 323. In his view, the provisions operate as a statutory stopper against the decision of the chairperson of the first respondent not to testify. Council submitted that this court in the ruling and the review failed to consider. We have considered the submission on the effect of section 26 of NRCD 323. We are not persuaded that the issue of statutory stopper held on us by the applicant's counsel by reason of not specifically referred to in the ruling and the review renders the ruling per incurium. We have also taken into consideration the applicant's reliance on Article 19, Clause 13, and 12, 296 of the 1992 Constitution. Yes. We are of the view that the applicant has failed to satisfy the court that new or important matter resulted from the reference to the constitutional provisions referred to. In the result, the application fails and it is hereby dismissed. But a long, hectic day in court was not all boring and full of legalese. There were the light moments. These affidavits, did they, were they not sworn to before the trial, before the hearing? They, it, they were sworn to during the interlocutory application. My lords, affidavits sworn to during... No, no, I'm asking, I'm just asking a question. Were they not sworn to before you put your witnesses in for hearing? Yes, they were. Thank you. And my lords, that has no significance for the reliance. It has no significance for the reliance that we placed on it in the conduct Order. of our case. Because your lordship, your lordship will... Be satisfied with the answer. Well, you can't be satisfied with your answer. <laughs> You, you, Order. Yes. Order, please. My, my lord, you can't be satisfied when I have not completed my answer. Order in court, and, please. I've not completed my answer, and your lordship says I'm satisfied with your answer. You're cutting me short in giving an answer that will address what underlies your questions. The court has to decide what it intends to do with this defiance of its orders by the petitioner. I think Mr. It's, Mr. Kutumpa, you are telling us what to do. No, I, no I'm not <laughs> telling you. My Lord, far from that. Mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not one of those lawyers who think that they know better than the court. <laughs> the enhanced panel may have dismissed Mr. Chikata in his review application on the decision affirming Mrs. Jin Mensah's decision not to testify but the venerable lawyer did not give up. We decided to set a date for judgment today. Yeah, but uh, our attention has been drawn uh, by the registrar to the fact that a, an application for review of the last ruling has been uh, lodged at the registry. And we want it to be adjourned to Monday so that uh, we'll come and take it on Monday. 
in respect of former President Mohammed's application for stay of proceedings, the court dismissed it as moot. The seven-member panel of the Supreme Court is adjourned to Monday, February 22, 2021. That was my colleague Sixtus Dong Ulo's wrap of proceedings in court. Now, typical of both sides, after proceedings, they addressed the media to express their thoughts on how the entire process went. Let's hear what they had to say. In the court's decision on the matter, they simply said that they disagree with us because we have not shown that these fundamental errors of law have occasioned any miscarriage of justice to the petitioner. And that is why we vehemently disagree with the court. We respectfully but vehemently disagree with the court. Because these applications are not being brought for nothing. We believe that in line with Article 19, you know, Clause 13 of the 1992 Constitution and Section 26 of the Evidence Act, Jim Mensah must be made to testify based on her own election and to answer questions that are germane to the issues before the court. And that refusing that would deny the petition of fair hearing. What else do we need to prove because before the court will know that the non-compliance with Section 26, respectfully, has occasioned a miscarriage of justice to the petitioner? Because I, that is without saying it is a given that their non-compliance has occasioned a miscarriage of justice to us. So what we want to tell Ghanaians who are watching this briefing, particularly the over 6 million Ghanaians who voted for His Excellency John Dramani Mahama, is that some of these decisions are not going in our favor. And there is a tendency for some of you to be crestfallen and sad. But we are standing here as leaders who have the authority of His Excellency John Dramani Mahama to tell you that don't give up and don't give in. Chain up, square up your shoulders, because no matter how this court decision will go, no matter how it will go, Ghanaians, all of us are descending. The world is watching, and we will all know the truth for ourselves. Thank you very much. If you have any questions. The mere repetition of arguments does not metamorphose your arguments into a correct one. So that is what we must take note of as friends of the media. Secondly, the stay of proceedings was struck out as moot. This is based on the assertion that the stay of proceedings, which is um, an application to put an, a halt to proceedings, would, would, was pending the review. But then the review had been already dis, um, determined. And as such, there was no need for the stay of proceedings to be heard. And as such, the court gladly struck out this application. With regards to what will happen on Monday, the court held that based on the, another application by the, applicant, the petitioner, the court will then hear these applications and proceed to give a, a firm date for judgment. However, it is instructive to note that an order of court cannot be halted by an application for stay of proceedings, nor an application for review. So this repeated non-compliance with the orders of the court is something that is unacceptable behavior. Even for any um, member of the bench or any court, this is unacceptable. Much more the apex court of the land. And this should not be countenanced. With this argue of, argument of estopel that keeps on being bandied about, the court firmly dismissed this argument and stated that it does not apply in these circumstances. The court further held that the, the court further held that the strength of your case does not depend on the weakness of your opponent's case. <laughs>